Hi. During this session, I'm going to be talking about wave characteristics. To start off with, and the reason why you have this image in the background, I want to think about and imagine a wave traveling across the sea. The wave's going up and down, up and down. Now, in this case, the medium is going to be water. And often we'd think about the wave kind of charging towards us in some way, and that's what we need to think about and get a kind of straight in our heads. What does that really mean? Well, what a wave does is it transfers energy. What's coming towards us is energy. That's being transferred via the wave, through the wave's motion. Uh, what's actually moving, the particles themselves, or the parts, or the water in this case, is actually going up and down. It's not moving towards us in any way. The water is just going up and downwards. And in fact, if we averaged out the motion of the water, um, it would cancel out to nothing. It goes up a little bit, it goes down a little bit, it goes back to the middle again. That overall motion is actually cancelled out. So there's a, a, a net zero motion for my particles. But these particles move up and down in a manner, and the fact that these particles next to them are moving more up and less down and more up um, causes us to be able to transfer energy from one place to another. And this, um, I guess what we we'll describe as best described as a continuous traveling wave, is the idea of a wave which is traveling and transferring energy. And it's continuous because there's wave after wave after wave appearing. Um, we could have a similar situation where we could just have one wave pulse. Okay, So we have one wave pulse traveling along, and that transfers energy. But for this situation, I'm going to try and think about uh, a continuous wave. So that's normally caused by something which is oscillating. So if we think back to simple harmonic motion, actually a lot of the particles we're going to be talking about are going to be going up and down in something which tracks simple harmonic motion. But now we're going to think about it on a, a larger and more continuous and energy transferring scale. So it's not just a, a repeated motion, it's motion which allows the transfer of energy. So that's my background about waves. And I think it's, it helps us to just get our heads right. Um, I'm going to talk about the similarities and differences between two types of waves. These are longitudinal and transverse waves. So let me introduce these to you. So, Transverse waves to start with. A transverse wave, if we had a slink, is a, the wave which we imagine going up and down, up and down. So here's a nice diagram and we see that that's got that um, kind of wavy, ripply effect which we imagine on link with waves. But if we look carefully at individual particles, we see the individual particles are going up and down, up and down, um, but they're not traveling in the direction which the wave is. The wave is actually the transferring energy. Um, this is known as a transverse wave. And what happens here is the particles move at right angles to the direction of the wave itself. The other type of wave we're going to think about is known as a longitudinal wave. Now in this case, the displacement is parallel to the direction of the wave. Here, um, imagine a slinky whizzing things along. So we have a, a pulse running through a slinky. Now, although the particles are now moving in the same direction as the energy, as the wave itself, again, if we look carefully at the particles, we see what's happening is that they're just oscillating backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And it's this combination of particles coming together and moving apart which gives this this wave effect. So transverse and longitudinal waves um, are two types of waves, uh, types of um, waves which travel through a medium of some sort. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and talk about some of the characteristics and terminology to describe these waves. I'm going to think about transverse first and then think about longitudinal but you'll see that the terminology has some similarities. So, first up, the transverse wave. The diagram I've shown here is a displacement against time graph. So we're imagining the particles going up and going down, going up and going down. What we have, and there's some important terms here, um, First of all, some of the terms are that at the, um, the top of the wave is known as a crest or a peak. Um, 
and at the bottom of the wave, so uh, the maximum displacement in the negative direction is known as a trough. We have something which is known as the amplitude, and the amplitude is half the height of the wave. So from the point of equilibrium up to the maximum displacement is known as the amplitude. And it should be the same if I go from the central point down to the uh, maximum negative value or from the central point to the maximum positive value. That's known as the amplitude. Now on a displacement time graph we've got to remember that it's time um, shown on the axis. So that means that the distance from a peak to a peak would be the period. So that's the amount of time it takes for the wave to be completed. So that's the period. Now, although it looks very similar, there's some, um, some difference here. This is a displacement time graph. Now, what I'm showing you here is a displacement distance graph. It looks very similar, has a very, very similar shape. Now, what we have here is the amplitude is still exactly the same. The amplitude shows the maximum displacement of the particles. Um, the shape is still the same. It still has that same sinusoidal sort of shape. But what we have now is imagining we're taking a photograph of a set of waves. And if we followed the displacement of those waves, what we'd get here is that distance time graph. So those are the ideas of a, of a transverse wave. And again, we still have troughs and crests. Um, now I want to think about uh, here, we can pull out the wavelength. Now the wavelength is the distance between one peak to a peak or simultaneously one trough to trough or from when the wave is going down through the central point to when the wave is going through down through the central point again. So that's the wavelength, the distance between consecutive points on a wave. Now longitudinal wave. So a longitudinal wave, and let's think about a slinky, uh, there's some new terminology here. Um, when a longitudinal wave, if you're imagining it on a slinky, the points are compressed together, that's known as a compression, and the point where the parts are spread apart is known as a rarefraction. So, rarefraction and compression. These are the things which are repeated time and time again, okay? So that, that repetition um, allows for this wave process to be going again and again and again and again. Now here, if we think about this, if we measure the distance from one compression to another compression, that would give us the wavelength. Okay. Or one refraction to another refraction would give us the wavelength. Now people often get confused when we think about trying to graph this. Okay. Now, if we just graph displacement against time, what we'd get is a very similar graph to what we'd seen before. Okay. So think about this, displacement divided by time, the displacement um, from the equilibrium point. Now this displacement is this time is in the direction of the wave, okay? So um, this displacement is actually going, I guess we'd describe it from left to right rather than up or down. But still that displacement against time graph would be produced, would look something like this. It's easy enough to follow. Now if I go back to my longitudinal graph here, and I've mentioned how the wavelength is distance between two repeated points. What people struggle with is um, sometimes to recognize or think about the longitudinal wave uh, on a distance time graph. Now here, oh, dis sorry, on a displacement distance graph. Um, here what we're happening, and I think what throws people, is the displacement, which is shown here on the y-axis, that's plotted as the distance uh, along the x-axis from the point of equilibrium. Okay. So we see it still repeats and goes through a similar pattern, but there's something people really, really struggle to get their head around, to recognize this is still this is a displacement distance graph. Now, unlike transverse waves, if I took a freeze frame a moment in time, the wave wouldn't immediately look like this. This involves a little bit of analysis and processing, which some people struggle with a little bit. So there's transverse and longitudinal waves as an introduction.
Um, let me take you through some examples of each of these. Uh, a longitudinal wave is a sound wave, okay? The air particles bang into each other again and again and again. And the typical transverse wave is light. Now, P waves, these are primary waves, and they're to do with seismic waves and earthquakes, and they quite often come up. Now, a primary wave is a longitudinal wave, so it's got that going in and out uh, feature to it, and they travel, travel very, very fast, and that's usually the first wave that reaches you. Um, sometimes known as a pressure wave. Uh, transverse waves, I guess a water wave going up and down. Um, then we also have transverse uh, uh, seismic waves, and this is an S wave, which is known as a secondary wave or a shear wave. And that's the wave which is, I guess, going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And this can be way more devastating. Imagine the ground shaking underneath you and the tower box being shaken from side to side. Now that has much more damaging effect. Uh, another example of a longitudinal wave would be an ultrasound. And finally, transverse waves, um, light, and all the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm going to talk about later on, we have ultraviolet as well. So that's your introduction to some of the terms needed to describe waves.